to your faculty members and your students. That's the beginning of this afternoon special seminar. First of all, I'd like to express our very sincere and warm welcome to Professor Dickinson from the Georgia Institute of Technology. We are very glad and if you are honored that you can come to Taiwan to attend the workshop and visit our department. We are very glad you can come. And uh, in the following, I would like to invite uh, Professor Julius Chen to give a very detailed introduction for us. <laughs> a very long history here about uh, Professor Dickinson's academic achievement, but I think uh, Professor Chen can do a much better job than I do. But before the introduction, I would like to present a small gift <laughs> to you. Uh,
question, uh, how, what is it we need to do to make climate models better? And let me introduce you, I'm assuming that you, uh, at least some of you don't know a lot about climate models, so this is sort of a brief introduction of what we do with a climate model. Um, we start with the known physical laws of conservation, momentum, energy, and mass. And then we uh, look at the atmosphere, oceans, and land as a continuum. That is, they have all spatial scales present, satisfying laws. And we find numerical approximations to these continuum physical laws. And we go integrated time to develop climate, whoops, um, climate statistics um, and we compare them with what's observed, and to some extent, they agree. And we evaluate our success then by the extent of this agreement. On a global scale, this has been very successful. However, when we get down to details, it's not working as well as we would like. Um, let me, again, graphically, this sort of portrays what we're doing, where we work with the whole globe, and we break it up into some spatial elements. Sometimes they're spectral rather than uh, um, geographically located, but anyway, a bunch of degrees of freedom uh, in the horizontal dimension and then a bunch of layers in the vertical. So this is sort of a standard approach for doing three-dimensional continual modeling. And this is kind of nice because it shows you, you know, the oceans and continent. And historically, climate models have been derived by meteorologists, so they've been perhaps undue focus on the atmosphere, but the um, oceans and land are, from a physical viewpoint, just as important uh, in both determining the climate and in actually being the climate. Since uh, the reason we study, uh, I think, uh, all of atmospheric sciences is because it's very important for people, and the most important part of the atmosphere for people from many applications is the part very near the surface of land and ocean. Now, a few applications such as flying airplanes and so on, you need to know details higher up. Okay, so that's kind of summarizing in a very simplistic fashion the fact that we make a numerical model out of the system. Um, and this little diagram here then is sort of telling you that besides the numerical description, we have to have a lot of physical process description as well. And, a key component of the physical process description is that we have to start with incoming solar radiation. This, this is the basic driver of, of, of everything that happens in the climate system. And I guess when I went to school, the atmosphere was everything, and we actually did most of the atmospheric dynamics on a short enough time scale that you don't have to worry about radiation. But when I learned a little bit about radiation, it was my impression that the only thing that counted was the radiation absorbed in the atmosphere. Well, that's maybe true for things like ozone and some of the further chemistry, but for doing the climate system, most of the radiation is absorbed at the ocean and land surface. There's, there's um, 
roughly 20% of incoming radiation is absorbed in the atmosphere and um, approximately 50% at the surface and the rest is reflected, so ballpark numbers. The part that's then absorbed at the surface um, is, represents a bunch of energy which uh, is exchanged by evaporation and heat exchange vertically. And this evaporation then is sort of the starting point of the global hydrological cycle. So that the um, so the dominant way in which the solar energy um, gets delivered to the atmosphere is through the uh, evaporation at the surface, and then the um, release of latent heat in the atmosphere. So the besides the, you know. The rainfall processes, besides being important because they put water to the surface, are also sort of the dominant um, energy mechanism within the, the climate system. Okay, so what I'm talking about today is how the system is breaking down um, our, our description in, in ways that uh, take a long time to um, really resolve, but basic issue is that when you break the system up into finite elements like this, that you're making assumptions about what's happening within each of these elements. So the continuum model works best if you only have spatial scales that occur um, that are large or extend over several of these elements. But unfortunately, um, the continuum system we have the atmosphere and land, especially an ocean, I think to some extent, have a lot of things going on uh, within these elements. And that's okay too if this will just average out. So if you can, all right, you can think of the start continuum system with continuum state variables. And we then end up with a numerical approximation that gives us discrete state variables so that each of these boxes has thinking about the atmosphere has a temperature, say, and, and the wind, and other so humidity and so on. And that's only going to work if you can average over all the small scale processes and, and they don't do anything to the larger scale. And, and that works to some extent for, for some aspects, I think, of the atmosphere. And maybe some aspects of the land and ocean, too. But other features are basically um, Nonlinear and, and simple averaging doesn't work. So we've got processes on smaller scales that are different than those resolved on larger scales. And these are important because they can affect the large scale rules. In other words, we have to allow for the, the smaller scale to get back up to the large scale. And this has been done for a long time in climate models to some degree. And, and point I'm making is that what's been done um, is too oversimplified compared to what is needed now. Um, we need to get into more detail because climate's very important and the scales, um, smaller scales that humans live in as well. So what I'm talking about is what's been called parameterization um, in climate models, but maybe a better terminology uh, would be scaling. I think the word, I was told at one time the word parameterization was invented by Joe Smagorinsky, but it seems if it was, it's reached a lot of other uh, scientists now. Okay, so Joe Smagorinsky, for those who don't know, was sort of the, the first person to do, they go back, to start trying to describe the atmospheric general circulation by working with the 3D uh, um, climate model. So our problem is that many of the practical aspects of the climate modeling are centered at the land surface. Okay, so I'm primarily talking about the land problem because that's the one I work on, but um, the same issues are easily seen in looking at some aspects of the atmosphere, in particular those involving the boundary layer and moist convection. And such modeling involves many spatial scales or scaling issues. And the, the 
I would argue that the most important ones may still be poorly represented in various ways. And one of the really big issues there's a lot of interest in, and, and still I think is on very shaky grounds, is trying to understand how you can change things on the land surface, and this in turn will affect precipitation. And we know observationally at times we can see things happening that people can maybe see urban effects, for example, or the city is there, or the city has grown and, and it may have changed precipitation patterns. So there's lots of sort of anecdotal evidence that when um, changing land boundary conditions will change precipitation. And this also happens all the time when you run models. That the problem with getting it out of models is you don't believe the details of the processes well enough to have confidence in them. Furthermore, you can get different answers if you run different models. And what, what's limiting here is the treatments of the moist processes. So, okay, convection clouds, aerosol, cloud microphysics, and so on. Okay, so this is probably something that I think people who just learn to do global climate models and don't think about these processes um, might be a bit shocked by me telling this. On the other hand, those of you who work on this scale realize that these systems are very complicated and there's kind of uh, doubtful that you can uh, parameterize it with the kind of simple reasoning that's been used historically in climate modeling. Of course, the fact that it's suspect doesn't mean you can do any better unless you do a lot of work. Uh, example of doing a lot of work, I was talking to David Randall, who's at Colorado State University. Last week I, I gave a seminar there on a totally different topic. And he's got this uh, Department of Energy sponsored project to build a global climate model at cloud resolving resolution, which he tells me means under five kilometer mesh. And he's not going to be there for at least five years. And then I guess he, his metric of success is he can run the whole thing one year. Okay, so there's a trade-off in climate models between running out long periods of time and, and getting more spatial resolution. So I briefly comment, a, a lot of climate modeling studies in recent years, let me go back historically, when I first ran into a climate model, which was at NCAR in the late 1970s, that Akira Kasahara and Warren Washington were running a climate model, and they were running, I think at the first it was a two-layer model, and what they wrote papers about is they would run what they call the perpetual July and perpetual January, and both of these would be you run a simulation for several months without changing the sun, and you wrote a paper about it. So that's the level of computation that, uh, you know, maybe 25, 30 years ago we were seeing. Okay, so what's happening now is that people, okay, so maybe five, 10 years after that, everybody was running an annual cycle as the perpetual um, months were just too unrealistic and they needed boundary conditions that were too unrealistic to um, really get you very far. Okay, so now the kind of simulations that are done are hundreds of years, maybe up to a thousand years, and ensembles. People now are not happy with just doing statistics on one model, so they'd like to run five or ten or you know, as much, as many realizations of a simulation as they can get computer time for. And so another direction is sometimes you can learn more by it's called a multi-model ensemble. You get several other people's models as well as your own, and you run all of them, and you get averages all over those. So I'm just mentioning those directions as those have kind of eaten into the computer time that otherwise might have been available to go into a higher resolution. So the resolution of climate models hasn't um, been getting finer very rapidly. Okay, so. The 30 years ago climate model was running 500 kilometer boxes and now it's down to at best 100 kilometer boxes. So the, you know, there's a factor of five which doesn't seem much but the 
computational time goes up more like the cube of that. So that means that you're running you know, at least 100 times uh, um, more computation. And the physical processes have also gotten a lot more complicated. So that's probably at least a thousand times more computation than people were doing um, 30 years ago. But that's still not much compared to, what would you say, Julius? Computers must be at least a million times faster, right? 10 to the 6th, or could be 10 to the 7th. I haven't thought through it lately. But so where all the rest of that uh, computational gain has gone, I think, is into doing these ensembles and, and doing um, the long runs. So it is at least possible to get down to five kilometers if you're willing to just run one run for a year and, and wait five you know, I'm talking about uh, uh, petaflop scale computers. So this is one of the themes of the U.S. Department of Energy. I'm trying to build petaflop computers at, at their laboratories. So, get this. Okay, so we s s sort of go back again and look at progress on the topic. And initially, the first thing you do, okay, so one thing you don't do is to just look at the system and say it's so complicated we can't do anything, which is a very easy reaction. And, and so, to some extent, people who have made progress have had to have a certain amount of bravery. Uh, I don't know, bravery or ignorance, I'm not sure which, but by um, realizing that you can make a lot of progress by ignoring a lot of the things that are complicated about nature. So we assume state variables on resolve scale, I've mentioned that. Okay, state variables, um, land might be temperature, oops, soil moisture, uh, vegetation properties. Okay, soil moisture. Again, this is sort of the same evolution. It started out as soil moisture just being one storage reservoir, one box holding soil moisture, and currently it's evolved to layer type calculations, but you know, maybe 10 layers is, is an appropriate level of detail. Vegetation properties, I can go into more detail on that in a little bit, but temperature, again, a single temperature. When you look at the land, there's temperatures all over the place. Um, the soil has temperatures at different levels, and you can kind of do vertical physics on temperature, but the spatial variability of uh, temperature is uh, pretty impressive also. And none of the temperatures you do in the model have a lot to do with the temperature that meteorologists measure. Okay, so meteorologists generally measure a temperature in, in a little Stevenson screen and maybe about this high above the surface. and then, so that's, careful control on, on what it is, but it doesn't, um, it's not intended to reflect sort of local um, surface process. You tend to put it, let me sort of, as an example, uh, if you live in a forest, you're probably going to cut down a bunch of trees and have a clearing to do measure the temperature. And you're not going to um, try to do a temperature related to the forest. Okay, so while the climate model not knowing how to cut down the trees to make a temperature measure is, tends to put the thermometer um, for the air temperature sort of above the forest rather than in the clearing. So there's lots of complicated disconnects between what's actually is measured as temperature and what you're going to make in a model. And I, I won't go into any more details other than say that's sort of a modern issue and one can fix it to some extent by trying to model what actually is measured. Okay, another assumption is homogeneous turbulent fluxes. That is, over land, you use similarity theory, so you, you, which is developed for surfaces that are all, it's all the same spatially. There's no difference. So that you assume you have one kind of surface over your 100 kilometer or larger box. And furthermore, you have the precipitation comes down uniformly over that box. Okay, this is um, again the first thing you do, and then you ask what's wrong with this. I guess it's the sort of logic that, that makes sense to follow. So we look for what's not working because of the fact that we 
have a lot of details that we've um, ended up ignoring by assumptions we made. Okay, that, so this is sort of a basic philosophical point in doing science. You see a lot of things, we assume this, we assume that, that's what mathematicians do. And we kind of follow them sometimes, but um, you know, we can't assume something that's not real. We can just hope we can approximate the complicated system by something simpler. So we're really making approximations where um, when we say we're assuming something. Okay, so we want to find ways to efficiently include the missing effects with adequate realism and generality. That's, that's the objective. And, and we hope at least in many cases that we will show that the missing effects were small enough that we were, um, it's not a big improvement to include them. You know, that, that's success too. You don't have to, in, in doing science, always show that what you're doing is important. It's sometimes very useful to show that it's not important. So let me go through some examples of the processes. I guess I've mentioned them already, but the clouds and their effects on radiation and precipitation um, have been put in. Um, okay, history of how clouds have been done. A cloud in a climate model is a fractional cover, like 70% cloudiness or 30% cloudiness. And the first clouds were just put in from observations. And I did this, I think, when I was an early postdoc trying to understand how this is done, running through some data. You can make correlations between climatological relative humidity and climatological clouds and get some correlations. And this kind of correlation was um, run for many years in climate models as, as the way to make clouds. So this is totally unconnected to making precipitation. Okay, so precipitation. Um, was connected to humidity in the atmosphere and the humidity that's run around in the climate model is the conserved humidity which is the um, specific humidity or concentration of water per some measure of atmospheric mass and that's moved around by winds in the climate model then and when you have um, convergence and, and upward motion that for the same amount of humidity you raise the relative humidity and the, and the relative humidity gets okay locally it gets well over 100 percent and cloud physics type processes um, kick in and you get rainfall sort of a very simplistic description of where rain comes from within the larger scale people recognize that maybe on a large scale the humidity wouldn't be getting up to 100 percent before you, you got rain. So um, I think one very common assumption was that the rain would happen once the relative humidity got greater than 80%. So you just, once, once the relative humidity gets greater than 80%, you take all that extra water out and knock the humidity back down to 80%. So that's the uh, early parameterizations of precipitation. So this is critical relative humidity, 80% is, I mean, I saw more often than anything else. And I should mention, historically, a lot of the modeling was started, I mentioned Joe Smagorinsky, and then he was followed or, uh, by Suki Manabe, who sort of tied things much more to the climate processes. And the first modeling then was done at GFDL and a lot of other climate modelers, I think people at NCOP, for example, if they didn't know what to do, they copied what GFDL had already done, which is it's okay to get started, but then you have to ask whether that was right at some point. Okay, so other examples, key examples of parameterization, the boundary layer turbulence, how it exchanges momentum, heat, and moisture between the surface and the boundary layer in the free atmosphere. Okay, and what's been done in everybody's model up to now is that there's sort of a dry boundary layer parameterization and then there's a moist convection parameterization that's uncoupled to the boundary layer. And in reality, the moist convection, at least the stuff I'm concerned with, that, that sort of tied to land processes, sort of comes out of the boundary layer and is connected to the boundary layer turbulence. So that this is one connection that hasn't been made yet by climate modelers. So this is kind of an obvious thing you'd want to include. 
the collective effect of leaves and roots to extract water from soil and move it into the atmosphere is, is another um, feature that needs to be parameterized in doing land. Okay, and moist convection, how you make clouds and precipitation, I've mentioned a couple of times. Okay, so this is kind of giving you a mathematical statement of, of what the issue is. We think of the total global system or the climate system or the Earth system, um, lots of different, you know, ecologists call it the ecosystem, but it depends on what you're emphasizing what you're including and not including, the, the kind of names you use, but basically there's a whole bunch of things that are tied together, and there's a vector state variable that describes all of them. So we have a dynamical model describing this vector state variable, and it's nonlinear indicated here. We have some function of the state variable and a lot of external parameters, Q. And so it's, we've got something changing in time according to this equation. Okay, this is sort of a mathematical statement of sort of everything we do. I mean, this, this will describe it, all the chemical models Professor Chang is working with, for example. Now, we, the problem is that the state variable is occurring on all scales, and we break it up into a resolved scale and an eddy scale or an unresolved scale. And we can solve this in most simply by just solving it for the resolved scale, but because of nonlinearity that the unresolved scale or the eddy scales um, also have to be allowed for. And this has been done in turbulence theory and meteorology with some very simple approaches called uh, Reynolds fluxes and things like that um, that are, are useful. Um, in some contexts, but are not really uh, work for some of the land issues. Okay, so this is sort of just a schematic illustrating the picture is kind of giving you a flavor of the same thing we're talking about. We have a dynamic system on the climate system, and it's got forces, in particular the sun, and, uh, describe many other things, either as forces or as part of the system. Let me comment on that. One of the biggest issues now is the uh, global warming due to greenhouse gases. And we can take the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as sort of all prescribed by a, a, a scenario and that's then a forcing. Or we can take the human added CO2 as prescribed but then try to get the interactions with the oceans and terrestrial system as an interactive component. Some models have done that now. Or what's probably most appropriate, but also most difficult, and, and not really attempted yet, is to somehow model the human system too. So that how much, you know, how much fossil fuel humans are going to use is, is a, a question of the human dynamics. And, and if you could model humans for the next 50 years, then you have a complete internal um, dynamics pushed only by the sun. Okay, so we have climate system responses then and then the impacts on, on the human welfare. So we have many processes on many scales that can change and modify the changing state. Okay, I talked about some of the global forcing. We have on, on the smallest scales, we have lots of uh, local land use changes. Somebody decides to cut down some trees and turn it into a, a garden, for example, and these end up on regional scales. Um, tropical forests are going at a very rapid rate and have been for the last couple of decades and maybe gone in a couple more decades. And that modifies the land surface in rather profound ways um, that then couple back to the atmosphere and then we get to the question of how do we do this coupling? And then the coupling is through these small scale processes in the atmosphere that I'm saying we still need to do a better job on than we do now. So what we've done up to now is use simple conceptualizations of processes and sort of tie those to limited observations. And what we can do now to move forward is we have much more advanced computational 
and also to some extent observational tools. Computations, I think, advance faster than observations. So that, okay, so a very simple example. Um, the aerodynamics of airplanes used to be studied with wind tunnels, and now it's all studied on computers. So nobody worries about how wind goes by an airplane wing anymore with a wind tunnel, I don't think. Maybe there's still some out there, but I think it's all done on computers. So you can do a lot more detailed science now with computers than we could do even 10 years ago, and we'll be able to do a lot more um, 10 years from now. So there's, I think it's still a big growth area doing computational science, uh, getting into a lot of details and then seeing how they add up to the larger scale processes. And one aspect of this that so we've had around for some time now, cloud resolving and large eddy resolving models, but they still haven't been exploited, I think, very much or to the extent they should be in terms of telling us how to, how to do um, the parameterizations or how we modify what we do in, in the larger scale models to incorporate the knowledge we get from these models. So I think this is still sort of in its infancy in terms of actually being useful for the larger scale modeling. Um, we also have a lot more satellite data and a lot higher quality satellite data than we had even 10 years ago and it's still possible to do advanced field programs but with better technology and better aircraft and radar and so on. So all these need to be employed to understand the processes and the scales we don't have in the cloud model to the extent that we see how to scale them up to the cloud model. Of course, there are many other reasons to understand um, these scales, such as you know, advanced warning of severe weather and things like that. So the, I think there's a, a lot of room for the climate community working with the weather community to, 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 together to understand the, the atmospheric end of these things. Okay, so I've sort of already been saying this, but atmos observations are very important and these can be real observations or when you run complicated models in a way that you're producing another kind of observational data to analyze. Okay, so real observation um, for land, say local surface or for meteorological observations, field programs, aircraft, satellite. And these get very expensive and, and if we want to do things globally we have to have international cooperation and sharing. So the, um, it's very important to, I think, be connected to the rest of the world to, to expect to get a lot of progress in the global climate system. Now this is sort of a NASA thing showing that it's a little outdated now, but I've seen NASA people still showing the same slides, so there's not a newer one. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that with a constellation of satellites, and not all of these are doing the uh, um, climate related stuff. But, but anyway, that we, we can monitor the system and see how it's changing and get details out uh, much better than we could without them. The flip sign is these are very expensive and they, they tend to not last as long as you'd like them to. Um, some of the uh, current observations are so valuable that we'd like to see them continue for the next 50 years in the future, for example. But on the other hand, it's very hard to, to get the institutional commitment, even in a rich country like the U.S., to actually keep that going. Okay, so this is just sort of an example of how complicated land gets. So let me point out a few features you see here. This is a, a, a MODIS. A, a MODIS is a, a, a land, in, well, among other things, a land imaging instrument on the uh, um, Terra at Aqua on NASA platforms. And this is showing uh, a lot of lakes, and I think the green stuff here is probably vegetation. So there's patches of vegetation, and this sets another version of water. I'm not quite sure what the, the coloring is. And anyway, there's definitely uh, ice fields here. So there's lots, there's something like 50,000 glaciers in, in, in that plateau. And so there's a range of elevation here, uh, probably 
I don't know exactly what this is looking at, but it's several kilometers from what I've um, seen in, in uh, Tibetan elevation. So when you look at this image, and then you start thinking about things. Um, one of which was, I'm not sure if this was winter, but you look at Tibet in winter and it doesn't have much snow outside of the glaciers. So why does Tibet have so little winter snow outside of its glaciers? On the flip side of that, which has been around a long time, why do climate models make so much winter snow on Tibet? <laughs> it's t t Tibet, the Tibetan Plateau is uh, this pointed out to me, I think, 20 years ago, is a big anomalous excess of precipitation. And lots of reasons for that have been found and fixed, and there's still way too much, but it may be only a factor of two too much now. It used to be a, more like a factor of 10 too much. Okay, one can think about the connection then of the glaciers to the uh, um, warming over the next century and people associate glaciers and the winter snowpack with the water resources and that seems in China anyway to be something that's at least not as studied as, as it might be. Um, issues like how can we uh, quantify how much water is stored now and how much will be in the future. This is the kind of thing you can get from a climate model if it's resolving this level of process, which it's not now. So that's one of the issues. How can we include this kind of issue in a climate model. So from the land viewpoint, we've got grid squares that are roughly 100 kilometers within a factor of four in either direction. You get down to 25 kilometers, so it's kind of hard to run that globally, but you can. And some people run the climate models that are still out to about 500 kilometer. Uh, primarily now, I think, for doing paleoclimate studies where you want to run for very long periods on, on a PC or something. Um, but we have land processes. When we model the land processes, we kind of describe them on about a 10, 10 meter scale, which you would call a plot or point scale. This is the scale we actually get observations to tell us whether the modeling the land is working right. We don't have observations on the 100 kilometer scale of of the land processes. So we need to go from this 10 meter scale to the 100 kilometer scale. And this, this has to be part of the map modeling now. And it has been included in lots of ways in the past, but generally ad hoc assumptions and kind of gets lost and it's not really seen for what it is. It's some sort of basic physical description that has to be made a separate part of the model an example of kind of problem I'll be uh, alluding to a couple of times today is uh, there's an earlier land model of NCAR developed by Bowman when, when water falls on the leaves with the water coming down uniformly over a grid square you can lose a huge amount of it to evaporation so he said it can't be more than 20% of precipitation well that kind of fixed the problem that it tended to be 50% of precipitation, so he knocked it down to 20% by putting a kind of an if-then kind of fix in, in the model. Okay, so we have, I'm arguing to make land in a climate model make sense, we need to work with three different pieces that are separate conceptually. The, the rules, well, we start with a plot scale land surface model which a lot of people you, you kind of connect to the, the people who don't do local land stuff, the ecologists and so on, tend to do all their observations um, on that scale. Then we need rules for scaling to a climate model, and then we need global data sets describing land and also helping us to scale. The kind of global data we can get are done to scales about one kilometer, so we can take the one kilometer data and come up with rules uh, to get it up to 100 kilometers. There's not a lot we can do to get up from the 10, 10 meters to the one kilometer scale, but um, I think probably the one kilometer to the 100 kilometers is the more critical um, scaling region. And then these all 
need to interface to an atmospheric model. So I'll give you one simple example of how things uh, don't work if you have a nonlinearity that, okay, so there's just a cooked up simple example. But if you have, um, frequently in the simpler modeling of evapotranspiration, where you just have sort of a single water reservoir variable W, that you get plots like this, that the evapotranspiration is zero when it's dry enough, and it reaches some maximum, sometimes called potential value, when it's wet enough, and then there's some kind of a curve like this, a, a hyperbolic tangent or type of curve uh, connecting the, the, the dry to the, to the wet. Okay, so now if you have 50% of, of a land area, say these are two boxes here and we want to average over both of them, and 50% is um, down at zero, and 50% is one on this scale, and then what happens if we average over them and we get W of a half? Well, it depends on where we end up on this curve. I sort of drew an arrow here, we can end up in this curve, so we're still getting nearly 100% of the ET, ET. So we've gone, so we've doubled the ET by not being able to scale be, between what's going on over these two boxes. And we have, that kind of illustrates sort of an extreme example of how the small scale processes over land involving uh, moisture don't add up uh, if you just take a simple linear average of them. Okay, these are some computational examples of um, the thing I've already mentioned, the Kennedy evaporation. Okay, and the way I do models is I tend to not make ad hoc assumptions, just try to do the basic physics and then see what's wrong with it and then try to think about how to fix it. So uh, anyway, that's kind of an excuse, but I've, I've always, when I've made land models, ended up with something that looked like this, getting canopy evaporation over the Amazon to be 40 or 50 percent. This was the thing that Gordon Bonin was trying to fix. And, and, okay, so how does this happen? Um, if you have vegetation and you have a drizzle happening on it all the time, which is what you get when you have 100 kilometer grid squares running over a, a tropical region, um, Taiwan would be maybe one grid square at most. And during, I think, even the dry season in Taiwan, it's, it's raining somewhere, probably at any one time. So if you average it, that over all of Taiwan, it'll be raining all the time over Taiwan um, at, the, at the scale of just averaging over Taiwan. So what happens is rain occurs much more locally and comes down much more in, intensive than that. So if you allow for for that, okay, so I won't go into details here, but basically we broke the land into a bunch of different sub-tiles or, or sub-elements and did stochastic modeling of, of the precipitation intensities to get the right intensity and we get down to uh, less than half as, as much uh, canopy evaporation as we did with this uniform drizzle. And this is showing Amazon and the same kind of thing on the land, the, the, the numbers again are about a factor or two different. Okay, another example. Let me, what time should we end, Joyce? Maybe another 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Just comment on um, trying to understand the details of how resolution works over the Tibetan Plateau and what that has to do with precipitation. Um, this is showing a low resolution climate model, approximately. 250 kilometers on the side, and twice as good a resolution, maybe a little closer than 100 kilometers on the side, and 50 kilometer, and this is showing um, relatively fine spatial data. And this is just showing the elevation and how it changes with, well, uh, um, with resolution of a model. And by the time you get to the 50 kilometer, you start getting uh, somewhat realistic, but you're still missing stuff that you see in this data, okay? So what you see in this data is there are these ridges here, 
and here in an east-west direction, and then the elevation is relatively low here, so you basically have a relatively low section of the bed where the, a lot of the uh, uh, wind can go through here, and not go up o over the higher parts. Uh, if you have this resolution and, and the wind um, is coming um, from west to, to east, you're, you're just going to push the wind up over the Tibetan Plateau, actually coming from any direction. So you're just going to push the wind up over the Tibetan Plateau and sort of maximize the precipitation. So, so one thing that's going on here then is that with, with higher resolution model, more of the moisture can sort of work its way through the valleys and not be pushed up over the mountain. Okay, this is, I'm not going to go through any detail, but the point of this is um, observations for seasonal cycle over uh, the, 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 the gray thing here. And this is sort of summer monsoon. There is a substantial amount of precipitation. Um, but the Winter time is, is very exaggerated by all the model resolutions, but it improves um, nearly a factor of two by going to higher resolution. Okay, so now we talk about radiation scaling. See if I miss it. This is sort of discussing the issue of land scale. And when you start with leaf scale, and you go to plot scale, and then you want to go to the scale which the satellites can see, and, and, and then add that up to a planet model. This is an example of a, sort of a big individual bush in the Takamakan Desert. I thought it was very photogenic in terms of illustrating the complication of trying to do a land surface in a semi-arid region or arid region. So this is what was the topic of my seminar last week. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of the issue here. But the current climate models treat the radiation entirely in terms of a, a cloud of leaves. So we, we model distribution of leaves that are assumed to be like cloud droplets, homogeneously distributed. So it's, it's sophisticated mathematically, but still pretty unrealistic in terms of reality. And it best represents what, what you would get if you had all the vegetation put together in one plot and then took all the bare soil and put together in another plot. Which might happen if this is where you irrigate and this is dry and you grow it. But commonly in the natural systems, if the underlying surface is homogeneous, that the vegetation is going to distribute itself uniformly and look more like this than than this. And this is uh, another view of the same thing. And what happens here is the radiation in this system acts very differently than the radiation in this system. And the simplest thing that's different is the shadowing. Here the shadowing is just from the leaves. And here you have geometric effects. So you have a whole bush shadow that's happening on the bare soil that's not under the bush. So and this is the bare cell that would have been put over here and not have any opportunity to, to receive the shadow with this description. Okay, so what difference does that make? Um, can be a factor of two or more uh, radiation loading on, on the bushes if you allow for the detailed geometry and that much less radiation taken from the bare ground. So, a big difference in the distribution of radiation. Of course, you may end up getting the total reflection or albedo right if you fit it to some data. But you can't get it quite right just from computing from this, this kind of description since it's too unrealistic. Okay, so these are just kind of issues of some of the questions we ask the climate model. If you, um, you could have this leaf area index is the projected leaf area per, per unit surface area. And you could have that three over 100% or six over 50%. Or, so anyway, there's various different questions you can look at involving the nonlinearities. 
Um, surface roughness is another thing that doesn't uh, simply average out to you know, forest and grassland. And so the one thing that's been done in the model is tiling, which is have different kinds of vegetation and bare soil and separate tiles, which handles some of the heterogeneity of the vegetation, but there's a large number of other more important sources of heterogeneity that are not handled. Um, skip the rest. I don't have time to explain this. Let me just mention in, in two sentences, showing some data of this was an example of it. This is in uh, Sahel, uh, Sahara, a very heterogeneous 10 by 10 grid square. These are one kilometer satellite data. And this is much more homogeneous. So you can either have land heterogeneous or homogeneous. So the issue is land complexity. We have a lot of little pieces, and then they can add up to a few pieces. So we, we set out a large number of dimensions, and we want to project to one or a few dimensions. And we've commonly done this by averaging, but we want to look at more complicated things. So this is illustrating, this is just sort of showing this thing I was saying already, that the um, shading by a single object here can extend over an area that's uh, in horizontal extent much larger than the horizontal extent underneath the object. And therefore, and this is a shadow. You don't know what shadows look like, so I won't elaborate on this anymore. So we want to reduce to very complicated to lower dimensions and provide possible two-way linkages to the large atmospheric variables. This is sort of a mathematical problem. When we do this, we want to maintain energy and moisture uh, conservation. So sort of basic conservation laws are with us everywhere. We have to make sure we keep them. And one can do this with stochastic or distributional type of modeling. And that's sort of basically what I've been working on while I'm working on the details. Um, just sort of mention we use distributions, an example distribution of precipitation, for example, three, three millimeter, two millimeter, one millimeter, and you can say that's a function in a precipitation. We apply this to land model, and we, um, I'll skip all this. Um, issue is, I mentioned how a land model processes and precipitation coupled. And these depend on a lot of things involving fluxes and local heterogeneities, elevations, variations of vegetation, soil wetness. So a whole bunch of things involved. And um, major concept is, is the uh, boundary layer and the dry and moist convection coming out of the boundary layer. And there's been recent studies, uh, AMEP2 and Henderson Sellers. <coughs> Comparing different models, there's glossy in it comparisons. Uh, a bunch of GCMs have been run and look at the uh, quantitatively the coupling between the land and the atmosphere, and, and then just sort of show what the results look like. Where there's some metric of coupling, and there's sort of two metrics here. And some models are down here near the zero on both of them, and some are way up here on both of them. So this is sort of uh, all over the place in terms of when you take a bunch of different, all regarded as sort of world-class type models and compare them. So the coupling between precipitation and soil moisture and, and, and land is still an open question. So conclusions, much of the remaining science for climate modeling is determination of how the small mesoscale processes add up to global climate systems. Uh, local, regional, and global are all important. Thank you. Yeah. 
这些科目嘛，都人家已经做，或者是说哪一位教授各方面已经做了之后，他这个时候在十年前开始做的工作里面，也很多要商品，这些商品到底有好有坏，不谁都不知道，他自己都不知道，所以你要看他的商品是什么，然后看他这些商品现在的眼光、现在的技术和细节，是不是可可以重新探讨，这是大家。应该做的问题，这个人家这方面在这方面已经努力了二十年了，他还在挖很多的细节。像他问的，就被人把错的这些问题，中国人自己都很少问。嗯，他现在问出来就就就，你问出来之后，你就想到一些可能的答案，你就想到一些可能的题目了。所以不是说可能吗？我们很多人做了，不外那么多人做，我们就做不出新的东西来了，还是有很多新的东西可以做。我想今天丁工教授最主要的给我们的一个提示就是说，仔细看，仔细想，不要把人家讲的、人家做的东西就是当做是理所当然，因为很多东西不见得是对，啊，很多细节要从思考过。来，教授 ，translate， 开完水之后的这句话就是。Everything should. We should look the thing from the global scale, and we should do things from the small scale, starting small. There are many problems still to be done. Many existing model has assumptions which has not been examined in great detail because the, during the development of model, they don't have time to do all the details that all information on the language. So I'm encouraging students to look into the following year. Suggestions. Yeah, that's yeah. That's yeah. The Any, the world press models have lots of things wrong with them. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right. Actually, the best model has many mistakes in it. So you need to find a mistake early. This is a mistake. Okay. 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 什么东西要用自己的眼光、自己的想法、自己看一下。好，但是中间还有一些老师在场老师有什么问题？啊，有没什么意见？介绍一个，看我。Yeah, I'm wondering. You you focus a lot on the land process and how you interact with the climate model. How about the ocean, which is much bigger, and the interaction with the air and ocean forces? Because you know, the part of the coupling is clouds. Again, our issue is much lower ocean than land. In fact, clouds occur on you know a lot of clouds on a small scale compared to the climate model. What fraction of the area you cover and how thick you make them makes a big difference in terms of how much radiation they go through, especially solar. So, so that, that's a common issue for me. Also, yeah, the oceanic boundary layer or something. But the ocean has, it has at least as complicated details at the bottom. So there's lots of bottom details that we left out of earlier models that people are trying to put in at various ways. Also, it's true. The land surface is more a semi-stationary. It doesn't move that yeah. except for yeah, so, 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 a long time. Yeah, so land is, is not a fluid, so it's, it's different from the uh, atmosphere and ocean. And so we're just sitting there, so in, this, in some ways that makes it easier. So right. it, it compensates for the fact that it's got a lot of details. So the, in the ocean, the surface processes, the mixing depth of up to 10 yeah. meters yeah. is rather complex, so yeah. much more complex than land. Yeah, so, uh, so the fluid where the land is the fact that the atmosphere is the parts of climate you're interested in. The, the land coupling to the atmosphere working through a fluid and lots of scales.
I could maybe come in and find modeling that you could think of. Maybe there's, I mean, there's many kinds of modeling. You just say, give it two kinds. There's advanced models that are sort of many people built and trying to be realistic and be useful for getting information. And you can contribute to those by working with many other people and trying to understand one part of the model. But there's no way you can build a model like that on your own. Nobody can. On the other hand, you can build little models of your own that are primarily for your own understanding or just understanding some little process. But it's, it's not going to have, it doesn't have the potential for prediction and you know, explaining details that are very complicated in all of this. So that's a sort of, there's a whole spectrum of modeling, but there's these two limiting cases that you can keep in your mind. Is it just the, uh, in terms of the resolution of the model, mm -hmm. My uh, ignorance. My knowledge my, uh, level is that on the level of using, say, NSAID data analysis type of data. And uh, the way I understand it is that the output is that reports, right, to the degree by to the degree. But the communication is done much, much finer. Okay, so the question is. The output may be coarse, but it might have been on a finer grid. And I think commonly, the, most of the averaging is time averaging. Okay, so these models are taking time steps of something like 10 minutes, half an hour is the longest. And so there's plenty of time resolution, the diurnal cycle of line processes. But the time step is limited by stability consideration for doing the atmospheric fluid dynamics. So when you go to higher resolution, you have to keep taking shorter time steps. So, but you don't want to fall on your time of statistics are like, well, you're, you're talking about, I think they give you every six hours, or maybe they give you 24 hours. Um, yeah. so, sometimes they just sample every six hours. They're probably just sampling every six hours, but they're more useful if they get a six hour average and give it to you. But I don't think they've averaged very much um, spatially. If they've done globally, yeah probably been doing about a 100 kilometer um, on side model to, to do the reanalysis to begin with. So, so it might have done a factor of two times of that, which is not a huge amount. Because one reason you want to average is just for storage considerations. Um, Meteorological models used to require a lot of storage compared to what you had for hardware. But I think they've been totally outpaced by satellite data now. And so the neurological models are relatively easy to, to store a lot of output because the disks and the good room is so rapid. Bob, I have a question. Yes. Um, what's your view on ensemble approach? How useful this will be uh, in the long run? I have a feeling that this may be a short, near-term fix to what we don't know. Okay, so in some whole approach, and there's two kinds. One is running your own model multiple times with changing initial conditions or somewhere to get a trend on different. In other words, multi-model in some level where you run a bunch of different models. Yeah. Um, it's been fine for weather prediction but the multi-model running different models and even your own model um, gets you faster to better answers than increasing resolution just doing one of them but ultimately you need to be both to go to better resolution and um, running so it's a okay if they're basic systematic errors so we'll get rid of them but if if you're making random errors, of course, that's the ensemble of your own model will take, get rid of some of the random errors. Not very quickly, it's, you know, something like Gaussian, or just go like the square root of the samples. And the purpose of running uh, different models is to maybe, you know, at least you can deal with it as sort of you make random errors in the physical 
parameterizations, uh, processes, or numerics uh, make errors that are randomly different between different models, and you get some of that to cancel. But, uh, the, okay, so what we're talking about is how many of these things you need to sort of have some kind of mental statistical model of what you're doing, and often it's very, very crude or hard to come up with in terms of what actually is happening. But we, we shouldn't really become too dependent on this example idea, should, should we? Because if I unknowingly put the two bad models among the example, and we don't know how to evaluate, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I, I get a feeling some, some people start talking about example as the panacea for everything. Well, so we you give an example of them, but then you have comparisons of this and that. Right. And every few years or something comes along, some Chinese graduate student decides to develop their own model and get to the point they put it in the international uh, comparison it looks pretty bad. But, but the net result is that you don't see any improvement because there are always some people that are uh, contributing models that are outliers. That are, uh, so, but if you just evaluate models and say these are the best models and we don't know they're any different we can't say one model is better than another. Then at that point, I think the ensemble approach is useful. Yeah, okay. so I agree. Ensemble with this proper with uh, some with kind of evaluation, some kind of the quality assurance. Yeah. Now, ideally, if this you could evaluate different quality, you could give some weight. But I've been told that doesn't seem to do any good. <laughs> the IBCC does that. We just show you the result of the best models. I don't think they do some formal averaging. Uh, but the formal averaging is being done by weather services like BCMWF and also people doing climate forecasting. Uh, IRI. Yeah. I have one question. Try mm -hmm. uh, that. Yeah, my research is more related uh, to air pollution, air pollution modeling, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes I use regional scale mm -hmm. models like MM5 to mm -hmm. do the meteorology, mm -hmm. meteorological mm -hmm. data simulation, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes when we have to push it into very high resolution because we need very high resolution of meteorology over the mm -hmm. urban or city, mm -hmm. or big city. Mm -hmm. But we always have pro have problem in the simulated wind direction or wind speed. The wind speed is always too high, mm -hmm. and the, the surface wind is always too high. Mm -hmm. And uh, the possible reason I, I I know is that maybe because in the in the city or in the urban area we have very tall mm -hmm. buildings, so the roughness the, mm -hmm. the, the, the assumed the roughness may may mm -hmm. may be need needed to be modified mm -hmm. or or we have to. Okay, so let me sort of summarize that the question is why can the wind be too high in a fine scale model yeah. and somehow connected to surface roughness? And that's an example of what I was talking about a parameterization. Everybody, I think your model too, is using some simple view of surface roughness that doesn't really work in the system you, you want it to work on. And it's, there's, there's but the basic thing yeah, that's controlling the wind strength is how much drag is receiving from all the surface elements. And as you're saying, the tall buildings are probably going to produce a lot of drag. And I'm not sure you know, any, anybody has a clear idea how to put that in a model. Also, things like hills and, and mountains and so on are going to have effects as well. So putting in that level of detail, and if, if you really need to do it, the way we're going to do it is to do details modeling I was talking about. You do a very fine mesh model where you put in these objects as drag objects and you model the details and flow around them. You just try to model them with sort of a one-dimensional uh, parameterization. But, you know, most people don't have the time or it's not so important. You may even just increase your drag coefficient or something else. Which the observed wind is telling you something. And you can, the shortcut you can take if you don't have a year or two to do the, the right study is to just adjust some of your conversations so you get the right <coughs> judgment. 
Sydney. So now Zoom is more public. Then I have an email so we have now the other email. So this is an example of this one coming. Then the title of the video is more than one. I have a case here. I'm going to take it to the council. 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 因为我们是老朋友所以我们一个小公司就是要跟大家讲起来就是他就在成功的一个科学家他在以前大家了解一下一个成功的科学家的面是如何我记得很早以前我到一卡去开会他就他就以前讲的我们有一天晚上他说